everybody, this is Dr. Hack, and we're going to continue on with our endgame series today. We're going to put a new piece on the board, a knight. But I also need to give you a little bit of a roadmap as to where we are in the endgame and where we're going with all of this. Okay, so let me just, you know, use my art skills, not my art skills, but somebody else's art skills to show you guys that before we get going here. Let's do this. So I asked the AI for help again. I said, AI, give me a way to describe to these people what they need to know. And the AI said, I got you. And it drew me a tree. We won't judge, right? We'll just use what it gave us. So imagine that this tree is your chess game. And then these little rooty things down here then are your pawn in games, your foundation. And let's build from there. And we'll put the middle game somewhere up here. Okay. Every time one of these little finger knuckles connects to another one, that's where you're adding another piece, right? You're adding a pawn to a pawn. Now you've got two pawns. Now you're adding a third pawn into it, right? As it grows. And eventually you get up to one of these bigger intersections where you're adding a piece on the board. Let's call that, um, let's call that the rook that we did last week. Okay. So now you've got pawn endings with a rook on the board or a single pawn with a rook on the board. What happens when there's another connection a little further up? What about this one, right? And let's say that these pawn endings were eventually connected into a knight. And now that knight is connecting into the rook. We got to know whether a rook can beat a knight eventually. But first, before we can get there, we have to know whether the knight can beat a pawn and when a pawn can beat a knight. So, so we have to work our way up the next stem in order to get to the place where we can connect the knowledge that we have now with the next thing. I do hope that makes sense, you know, because if I were to expand this out and add more pieces to it, and maybe even gets more confusing, maybe you put the bishops over on that one, and now you've got a rook coming in, and you're adding a knight, and then you're adding a bishop to it, and you're trying to see if the knight and the bishop beats the rook, and the pawns too, boy, how confusing could you be? And maybe this big one up here, right, is where the queen sits, and maybe if she's off to the left there, she's on the board. And maybe she's off to the right there, she's off the board. So all these ones that we're looking at now are queen without the queen. And maybe we look at all this stuff again on this branch with the queen on. And as you get stronger and stronger, they all tie into this solid trunk, which is the middle game with, with all the pieces or most of the pieces on the board. I hope that analogy helps you know where we are. We are going to start climbing this branch today with the knights. And eventually we're going to merge in with the rooks. Let's get into it. Okay, so let's start off today with a bit of an exercise. Let's do counting. How long does it take this knight to reach this pawn? How many moves? Assuming the pawn never goes anywhere. Take a minute. All right, let's count together. Ready? One, two, three, four. Five. On the fifth turn, we land on the pawn. What if I told you that there is a shortcut to know how many moves it takes the knight to arrive on any square on the board? Would that be helpful to you? And the answer is, yes, Dr. Hack, but we don't know why yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, of course it's going to be helpful. Okay, um, here's the shortcut. Now watch, watch what color the knight moves to. Ready? White, white, black, white, black, right? White. Notice how it's an analog piece. It tick tocks between white and black, white, black, white, black, which means that every time you move the knight on an odd number of squares, or an odd number of moves, it will be on the opposite color to where it starts. And on an even number of moves, it will be on the same color to where it starts. So this, this pawn being on the opposite color, right? It takes one, three, or five moves to arrive there, never more. And on a black square, it would take two, four, or six moves to arrive there, never more. And actually, you can narrow it down further because the only way it would ever take five or six moves is if you're starting in one of the corners, in one of the corner four. And that is unusual for a knight to reach this bad of a location. And if you ever wondered why that was a bad location, now you know. It could take a long, long time for the knight to reach another thing. Okay, so let's move the knight around a bit. And let's just, let's just mess with this a little bit. How long does it take the knight to reach that pawn? Well, it's an opposite color. So it's either one or three. Remember, never five, we're not starting in the corner. And so if you can't reach it in one move, which we can't do, it must be three moves. Well, one, two, three. One, two, three. Hmm. 
one, two, three. There are a bunch of ways to get there, but it's always three moves as the shortest path. What about this one? Well, it's on the same color, so it's either two or four. Can you get there in two moves? Uh, I can't see a way to get there in two moves. Can you? One, two, nope, we're not there. Three, four. So it's always gonna be four moves to arrive from a knight two squares diagonal to a pawn. Hmm, what about this pawn? Well, it's the same color, two or four. Can you reach it in two? Oh, I can see a path this time to reach it in two. Perfect. How about this one? Directly beside the knight, it's an odd number. It's one or three. Can you reach it in one? Well, no, we jump over it in one. So it must be three then. Oh, easy peasy, right? So now we know a little bit about the, the nature of a knight and how they move and how to calculate it you know, with a shortcut, how long it's going to take it to get from somewhere to somewhere. We'll tell you why that's important in a minute. All right, so let me let me push you into a slightly larger world for a minute. I want to show you why a professional chess player will always beat you using a knight. Okay, always, without question. And uh, and here's why. It, it it lies within this position in a person making this move. Now, I'm going to unpack this in just a second here. I just want to show you that that's not the easiest way to make a draw. The easiest way to make a draw against a king and a pawn with a knight is to stay within this triangle of squares, right? We can move behind the pawn, and if he tries to move the pawn forward, we'll always just sacrifice our knight for it, and the game will end in a draw. So it's his job then to dislodge our knight, and he can try, but by trying, he always lets us go back in front of the pawn. So that's the easiest way to make a draw, is to never let the pawn move forward, and when it does, just to take it. Okay, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about this move. Unpacking this move will give you the secret to why a professional will always beat you at this game with the knight. Okay, so let's see what that did. First of all, we see that the king, we do, he doesn't want to move the pawn because he knows that if he does that, you'll take it and the game will end in a draw. And he also sees, and we see too, that he can't move his king through these squares because the knight is attacking them. So he's going to have to walk around this kind of wall to get to our knight to make him move again and get him out of there. Let's try moving around the wall. You see a problem with this move? It's black to move. Right, there's a fork. And so that one's off limits. What about this one? Oh, same problem, right? We got a fork and we can win the pawn. Okay, so those are no good. So what happens if the king moves to this square? Well, they're on different colors now. There's def definitely not going to be a fork when the pawn and the king are on different colors. But what if you could make the pawn move onto a white square, which we can do by attacking it with the knight. And now the pawn has to move forward, otherwise it will be traded for, right? And now we can make a fork and win the pawn. You don't actually win the pawn, you just sacrifice for it, but the game is in a draw anyways because there's no other pawns. And what if you go this way? Same thing, right? Huh. So what we're saying is now that, that this king can't move here either. There's this, there's this ring around him that's forming. What happens if he tries to leave these other two? Well, those other two happen to be safe. He can, he can do that. Um, for, for kicks, though, let me, let me have him break out of there for you. Okay, I'm going to put the knight in front of the pawn. He's going to break out of his prison, which was, you know, all these, these squares here. And he's going to move in front of the pawn. It turns out that knights are really good at some things and really bad at some things. And the thing that it's worst at is attacking a thing and also attacking the square in front of that thing. Because those are on different colors and knights just don't do that. They're always only attacking a single colored square. So if the knight tries to, to attack the thing, it will always have the square in front of it to move to. But what if it doesn't have the square in front of it to move to? Then when the knight attacks it and it can't move, that gives the knight just enough time to sacrifice for it and draw the game. So we can't move the king in front of the pawn either. So this square is off limits, and so is this one by inference. Hmm. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, there is a whole minefield of squares that your king cannot use if you have a king and a pawn trying to avoid a knight. And that minefield is vast, and professionals have this intuition, if they don't have it memorized, of, of when you've walked onto one of those squares, they say, oh, that doesn't look right. Something in their intuition goes off. And then they start looking for the specific way to win the pawn. Now, in order to illustrate that even further and, and show you one that's very, very entertaining to me, 
okay? We're gonna look at this position. And I'm gonna have you take something on faith with me for a minute, okay? And that is that a knight against a single pawn, no matter if it's a rook pawn or another pawn, can always hold the draw even if the king is over helping. Okay, but against two pawns, he most certainly cannot. Uh, the king will force him to sacrifice for one of the pawns, and when it's gone, the other one will make a queen. Okay, so the, the winning motif for white here is to move his king over to chase the knight away and make use these two pawns in tandem together, right? Use them together to make a queen. Make the knight go after and sack for one while the other one wins. Okay, that's what he's up to. <laughs> it turns out that it's easier said than done, or maybe it's even impossible. We're going to prove that in a second here. Let's see that king try to make its way over here. Okay, let's try all the moves. Let's start with this one. Black to move. Do we see how he can win one pawn? Yeah, right? Easy. Dr. Hack, easy. He can take the pawn. He can make a fork. He can win this one. And we know because Dr. Hack told us a minute ago that a knight can always draw against a single pawn. We're going to learn why that is just after this, okay? So we go back and we go, okay, so he can definitely win one pawn. That's good enough. This king cannot step onto this square. That's a bad idea. Should be the same with this one, right? Because we see there's a fork and we can win the pawn. So he can't walk onto this square now. Well, if you go back to what I said a minute ago, if you stand on the opposite color, there's never a fork. Ha ha, right? Progress. So now he's not on the same color as the pawn, but we can always make that pawn move if we attack it, remember. And so if we th consider the pawn being on this square and look for the fork between these two places, we see there's one here and there's one there. Is there any way for our knight to get to one of these two places in two moves? Oh, there is, isn't there? Because we know that going from a black square to a black square is taking two or four moves. In this case, two. We can go through this square and when the pawn moves, now we can make the fork between the two pieces and win the pawn. Great Scott, right? Okay. So we can't move between them. Well, can he move up? Let's try to go around them. Okay, opposite colors. We know the pawn is going to have to be made to move. If the pawn is sitting here, the forking squares are there and there. Can we reach either of those two squares in two moves after attacking the pawn? Yeah, we can, right? One, two, and we win the pawn. Oh, okay, so this king is really trapped, isn't he? He can't move down because our king's blocking that one. So what if he goes around this way? Well, that square happens to be very far away from this pawn, doesn't it? There are four files between. Hmm. And a knight can, if it's if a knight's sitting here, the best it can do is attack, you know, with three files between. That's the biggest stretch a knight can do. He can't do the splits. He's not a gymnast. He can get this close, right? Okay, so. So we can't make a fork between the king and the pawn now. But what if the king starts to walk forward again? And let, let's move him onto this square or this square next. Okay, either one. Because we've already, we've already tested out that one. And we know he can't do that. There's a fork. Okay, so we go. We move into another move with the king. He moves over. Can we solve to win this pawn? Well, we need it to move. So we need to think about it here. Can we get to that square or that square in two moves after attacking the pawn? But well, we only have two places that attack that pawn. This one, which we definitely can't make a move to get on one of those blue squares from there. They're both three moves away. Okay, so that doesn't work. We could try this one, and then the pawn moves. And we definitely can't reach either of those two, two squares. They're both still three moves away. So that doesn't work. So what if we get to one of these squares in three moves? How about that one? And we make the pawn move two more times. So now we're looking at this square down here for the pawn. And we're looking for forks between those two places. Well, there are two now. Can we reach one of those two places three moves from now? And the answer is, or four moves from now. The answer is yes, we can. But if we go here, it's going to be fairly tricky, I think. Because you're sitting right next to them. Very hard to reach a square that you're sitting right next to. What if we go this way, though? One, two. Always attacking the pawn, so it always has to move. Three. And on the fourth move, we made the fork between the two pieces. Great Scott, right? So we can't cross that one either. Not that one. Okay, let's go back to where, where we drew on the circles. There we go. Can't cross that one either. Let's see this one. Can he cross the square here? 
Well, same color. Can we reach that in one move? No. So the pawn's going to have to move twice. Can we reach one of these two in three moves? As a matter of fact, we can, right? We've already done that once. One, two, three. Great Scott. So we go back to the beginning again. He can't cross that one. Can he cross this one? Let's make him go over this way. Up, up, uh, and over. Okay. Well, the pawn has to move once and we'd be forking between these two. Can we reach one of those two squares in two moves from now? Yes. <laughs> After attacking the pawn this way, we reach one of the squares. Check. We win the pawn. Holy crap. Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? Because I don't think that king can cross the f-file. And in fact, he can't. It would, even, it would even be a problem if he tried to go on to f7 or f8. But he can't because he can't get through our king, right? He'd have to move on to this one first. So there is no way for this king to approach his pawns on the other side of the board when there are exactly two files between the king and the pawn. Well, if you just knew that much, right, you'd know what to look for if that ever came up in a game. A king is sitting exactly two files away from a pawn, and you start going and drooling because you're like, that knight, he wants to eat, you know, the big dog, uh, big horse. Okay, so uh, so that's, that's the step into the bigger world. We have to understand that that's what the professionals know that lets them beat you every time with this. Okay, they know when to start looking. <laughs> and some of them have it memorized enough just to do it, you know, that fast. So we got that part. Let's figure out the easy stuff. Let's figure out the practical now. Come back for a minute with me to reality. And let's look at uh, this one. And let's try to figure out how in the world the knight stops a rook's pawn from making a queen. Because that's going to come up a time and time again for you guys. We're going to need this. Um, so I want you to look with me at these squares. Those four, exactly. And first we want to, we want to take note that the knight sitting on any of those squares always has two options of where he can go. Right? No matter which one he's sitting on, there's always two options where he can go. Great. So that means that the king has to be able to block off two of those squares. And the two that are kind of opposite, you know, each other on this, uh, in this diamond. He has to be able to touch both of those squares in order to stop your knight from moving to them, which we see with the king is not possible. So that means your knight will always have a potential way to move. Okay. So if we go back to the beginning here, we know we can move this way. Remember the squares were here. And if the king chases us this way, we know we can go back. Okay. And if the king chases us and he's touching that one, we can come out this way. Check. And if he comes out this way, we can chase him. Check. Huh. It comes out this way. We got to go back. Why can't he move the pawn? Oh, because there's a fork. We get the pawn. Okay, so he comes out and attacks us again, but we can go this way. Right? Comes out and attacks us here. We can go that way. It doesn't matter what he does. He can chase us around this circle, this track, all day. We can keep running whenever he comes close to our knight, and it works. The only way that that wouldn't work is if your, if your knight was so close to the edge of the board, right? If the pawn were on the seventh row, now your knight can't stop it anymore because there's just not enough squares. From the, from the you know, A8, you've only got two places to move. You'd need to have you know, C9 over here to be able to make that track work. So we have to make sure we stop the pawn before it gets to the seventh row on the rook's file with the knight. And if we do that, he has enough space to be able to stop the pawn indefinitely by moving in this kind of square diamond type pattern around the pawn. Easy peasy, right? Cool. Let's see some, uh, let's see some practice positions to wrap this thing up. Let's, let's actually try some stuff. Okay, so this is white to move and draw the game using only the knight, no king. You're allowed to waste a turn with the king if you need to. What do you do? Okay, hopefully you came up with knight to c4 as the first move. Now I suppose there are probably several first moves that work, but only if we're thinking about this concept, which is if the pawn were to move forward, our knight could sit on this triangle of squares, the trifecta, so to say. And when the king chases you, we go to one of those squares. No matter which ones he's touching, we go to the third one and we sit there and wait. Okay, so that's the hope that we can set that up. What if black doesn't allow us to set that up? 
What if he tries coming this way? Well, now we've got this square, and we notice that the pawn you know, and the knight together are kind of blocking him, and if the pawn ever moves, we're already sitting on one of those triangle of squares. And if black tries to move around the pawn, we remember the fork, okay? And if black takes this path, we can force the pawn to move and then come back to sit in front of it and we're on one of those triangle of squares. And once you're there, there's no way for the king to dislodge you, right? He can walk down this way. And as soon as he gets close, we just jump to one of the three squares that he's not touching. And the game ends in a tie. Perfect. So then the only thing for us to check then is if the king goes here. Well, then we can jump back and forth between these squares. Because if the king comes back to harass us, we're back to where we started again. And if the king comes back here, we're back to where we started again, right? And if the king doesn't chase our knight, he can never move the pawn because we'll just take it. So we can actually jump back and forth between these two squares and hold the threat of making it onto the trifecta area and draw the game. If you got all that, well done. That's uh, Once you get really good at that, it's a really super useful tool in the end game because knights often need to stop a pawn or sometimes two. Let's try another one. Okay. So here we've got a knight that's blocking a pawn and doing a fantastic job of it. And we have a pawn that's trying very hard to make a queen. Okay, so we know this king can't walk away and try to chase our knight off because this pawn will make a queen way before he gets there. And we also know that this knight may have a hard time leaving the pawn because it only has one, two, three turns before it makes a queen. So if we're going to use the knight to try to chase the king off, we're going to have to do it with some alacrity. Okay. Which is just a big word for do it fast, silly goose. Silly goose was for emphasis. Right. So here we go. And we're going to try to do this. Uh, take a minute try to solve it, first of all. Hmm? We're going to try to do this by using the king to do as much as we can. And when we can't do anything else with our king, then we're going to bring the knight. Okay, and this is the moment where we can do nothing else with the king. So we need our knight to attack this square exactly to drive the king out of it. Now, there are several ways to do this. One of them is to checkmate him, right? Because if you, if you ask yourself the question, how many moves does it take this knight to reach that square? We know how to answer that. The, the answer is exactly three. Because you're going from a black square to a white square, and it's never five unless you're starting in a corner, and we sure are not. Okay. So we know it takes three moves to get there. So if we were to play this move and stalemate the king in the corner, we can make it to that square exactly three turns from now while the pawn is moving. And we get checkmate. Take a minute and try this one. I promise it'll be worth your time. This is white to move. Okay. I think the key to this position is realizing that the knight is in the wrong role. A knight can never escort a pawn to become a queen because it's very impossible for a knight to defend a pawn and also defend the square in front of the pawn so it can move. It can do one or the other, but never both. So a knight makes a really lousy tool for helping a pawn to make a queen, but a king, on the other hand, it does a really good job of that. A king sitting here, for example, defends the pawn and also helps the pawn move forward. So this knight is not in the correct role. He should not be escorting the pawn. The knight should be over here stopping these two pawns, and the king should be escorting the pawn. And now we can find several moves that work. For example, we can move the knight, or we can move the king closer to this pawn, and either one of those moves should end in a good uh, result for us. Let's try this one. And as our knight starts to come across to, to stop these two pawns, we have to ask, you know, how is black going to stop that from happening? Is black going to stop that from happening? Question mark. And uh, if he were to move, say, this one, it would make it very easy on us, wouldn't it? Because we, if we stick the knight in front of one pawn and guard a square in front of the other one, our knight can travel back and forth between these two squares, and a pawn will never make progress through there. Our knight's always got it when it moves onto the square. So now the pawns can't make any progress, and it's up to our king and pawn to beat his king, which, if we can waste turns whenever we want, shouldn't be that hard to do, right? We maybe we'd see it go something like this. And as our king progresses, we see that there's this one position that we want to avoid. And that is, should we stalemate the king? 
Hmm. Well, let's say that we did for a minute, for argument's sake. How long does it take our knight to get from where he is to put the king in check? How many moves? Opposite color, it must be one or three. So three moves to get to one of these two squares, if we stalemate him now. Is that enough time? One. Two. Oh no, we're in check. It didn't work, right? We needed our third turn and we never got it. That would be a great way to lose the game, wouldn't it? So maybe there's not enough time to do it that way. Hmm, that's unfortunate, right? So let's, let's not do that then. Let's not put him in stalemate. Let's bring our knight up and simply chase the king away. All we have to do is be here. Okay, so let's go, let's go this way. One, two, three. His king has to move. We can make a queen. He's in check. And now we have time to circle back and pick up the pawns before they become queens. How about that? Right? Worked out great. So if the king, if the black moves the uh, H pawn, our knight can just sit in front of it, stop both. Our king can escort the pawn. We get everything we want. What if we were to push this one? How do we stop the pawns now? Well, we need to be able to stop the pawn by sitting in front of this one or sitting on this square. Which one can we get to first? I think we can get to the black square in two moves. This is a white square. It's either one or three. So that one's the closest. So we aim for it. And as he makes any more moves, if he attacks the pawn, we'll defend it. If he moves the pawn, here we are, right? We're stopping the pawns from making any progress. And now our king can fight against his king, and we've seen this before. How do we get up close? This time it's different, though, because our knight is not three moves away from these squares. He's on a black square. He's only two. And so being much closer to those squares, if the pawn were to go and it's not going to queen with check this time, that's missing, we can just come back and checkmate him. How about that? I sure hope this helps somebody. You guys take care now. Bye.